Commutify presents Between the Lines with Andy Keaton. Each week, we explore the challenging issues transportation demand management professionals face on their journey to transition commuters from driving alone to more sustainable, shared and active commuting habits. Be sure to subscribe to hear next week's episode and check out our exclusive commuter playlists on Spotify. This is Between the Lines with Andy Keaton. Hi, everyone, and welcome aboard to this week's Between the Lines podcast. Today, I'm joined by Jason Stanley. Jason is the head of insights at Local Logic, a company building tools to help make the cities of the future more livable, thriving, and sustainable. He has led research and product teams at several technology and artificial intelligence companies, served on the Partnership on Artificial Intelligence's expert group on human AI collaboration, was an invited expert on AI issues for the organization of economic cooperation and development, and worked on labor market policy for the government of Canada. Jason holds a PhD in sociology from New York University and social science degrees from Oxford University and Williams College. So we're joined by uh, a certified genius, potentially. Um, (laughs) Thanks for joining today, Jason. We're really excited to talk with you. Thanks very much, Andy. Uh, I don't know about that, but I'll try my best. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really excited. I think this is gonna we're gonna get into some really interesting topics today, um, and it's all gonna be kind of under this umbrella of something that uh, you call location sustainability, and the topic today being why location sustainability will help save the planet. Before we kind of get into that and a little bit more about what Local Logic does, let's kind of set the scene here. So. Let's just start off with, you know, maybe a basic question for you, but maybe not for others. How do land use decisions impact transportation patterns? Yeah, great. So our cities, our regions are animated by people moving all over the place to get things done in their lives, right? We need to sleep somewhere. We need to eat somewhere. We need to get to work somewhere. We need to go to the grocery store to get our, our, you know, the the food that we're going to make for dinner. We need to bring our kids to school. We need to go to the park. All of these things that sort of make up our daily and weekly and monthly needs. We need to, we need to move around to get to those things. Those things are distributed in some fashion throughout a city or throughout a region, uh, and they're connected by some grid of streets and transit um, uh, you know, f- facilities and biking and walking paths and so on, right? So you can think of all of those things, those physical things as uh, pieces of the built environment. They're like almost like pieces on a game board uh, connected by roads and, and, mm. and networks and so on. The decisions that go into deciding where those things are on the game board are what we refer to as land use decisions, right? Is is a piece of a plot of land going to be residential or commercial or office or parkland or or a piece of infrastructure connecting those different things, or is it going to be some some mix of those things? There are millions and millions of land use decisions that are happening in the run of a year. Um, we think of them almost as micro decisions because it's not the macro plan itself. It is the, the individual decisions about where to build and what to include in the building when you're building it or where a household should move or where an employer should move. Those millions and millions of decisions ultimately influence how people are going to be able to move around to get their daily needs and their commuting done. Uh, We know people spend a lot of time inside vehicles and different modes of transit moving around. We tend to think of commuting as a really important bucket, as you guys at Commutify know really well. Actually, about 80% of the miles that an average household travels are not for work. They're for things like, you know, getting the kids to school, getting to the park, going to entertainment, recreation, grocery store. So the, how the pieces are, are laid out on the game board really, really matters because you may be spending an awful lot of time in your car or you might be walking to and from a lot of those things. So that's, that's what we mean when we say land use decisions are really important at influencing the patterns of transportation in a city or in a region. I really like the uh, game board analogy. That's, that makes it kind of, I can very much picture that. Um, so... Okay, so that's high level uh, land use decisions, and those are obviously impacting, uh, you know, I mean, that's an aspect of, I guess, this, what you might call a real estate value chain, and then going, you know, continue to go up that chain or down the chain um, to making real estate decisions. I wonder then, um, since this is a sustainability podcast, we're talking about location sustainability, how is sustainability being considered kind of throughout the entire real estate value chain? 
Yeah, that's great. So the the you know the value in supply chains for real estate are, are pretty big. There's many actors. I'm going to abstract away from a bunch of that um, that sort of messiness and focus on a couple of them. We have investors and asset managers, basically the people that are uh, you know providing the capital, uh, the financial capital to make possible developments, uh, the owning and building of properties. You have the the real estate developers that are actually building or refashioning aspects of the built environment. And then you have people who are occupying the different pieces that are that are built on the game board. Come back to that analogy. You have individual home buyers, households. You have uh, employers that need offices. You have you know retail chains that need to locate somewhere. Uh, you have you know companies that need to to put their uh, industrial or, or manufacturing or warehousing facilities in different places. Right, the people who are occupying. So sustainability comes into play in a variety of ways for these different actors. Um, for investors, uh, more and more of them are adopting ESG reporting and sustainability reporting practices. Uh, if you actually look at what they report on, though, overwhelmingly, they're focusing on things related to the actual envelope of the building. They're looking at like the materials that are used to build the building and the, uh, the facilities inside the building that make energy use more or less efficient. Um, and, and to some extent, the actual mix of the energy that's going into the electricity that's being used in the building, but they're not actually focusing on things outside those four walls that are related to the transportation. So we can come back to that after. So they do very much take sustainability into account. It's just a very particular and I think narrow definition of sustainability. Developers, uh, some of them, the, the biggest ones are starting to report on ESG metrics in the same way as investors are. Um, but there's also a really big wave of green building practices, more and more developers building with, you know, LEED certifications and other green sustainable building certifications. The same problem is, is true in, in that domain. Uh, if you look at the actual composition of those of those certification schemes, overwhelmingly they're focused on things that are not about things outside of the envelope. It's about the materials used, the construction processes, the energy systems inside um, those, those dwellings and buildings. Um, and those things are important. There's, it's just that they're, they're, it's a narrow definition of sustainability. They're missing the, the enormous amount of emissions and, and pollution and so on associated with the transportation to get to and from the asset in question. Now, they're, so they're not really thinking too much about transportation and mobility between these different assets, but they're definitely thinking about transportation in another framing. So this, this, this is why the, the, the question is a little bit complicated. Developers, investors, and so on, transportation and, and proximity to things is actually really important for them, but it's important for the classic market reasons. Like there's a reason that people are not building uh, residential towers in the middle of rural locations. And it's because those, those things are very far away from workplaces and, and restaurants and so on. Uh, and there's a reason that more, you know, a lot of developers have built in dense mixed use places in the past. Um, the problem, so it's not, it's not that they're not thinking about those things, it's that they're thinking of it through the prism of where the demand is. Uh, they're not thinking in terms of internalizing some of the externalities associated with how they build. So they're not going to build in the middle of nowhere, but they might build a, a suburban development that's completely single family detached homes and where they know they'll be able to sell those homes at an attractive price, but where the externalities associated with the transportation to and from those dwellings are not ones that are on the shoulders either of the people living there or the people investing in them, and so they're in a sense getting uh, getting away with it right now. Uh, in you know that they're they're building in a sense non-sustainable things that are market friendly. They're not being forced to actually report on and internalize and own the fact that those uh, those dwellings imply a heavy reliance on car and and specifically gas powered car uh, transportation for right now. Interesting. So yeah, so sustainability is obviously a key part of the equation right now. Um, transportation is maybe a, not really being thought about too much, although, you know, in a degree, because you want your location to be somewhere that people can actually get to, but kind of besides that, and that there's things around it that you can access, but kind of besides that, you're not necessarily thinking about um, the entire trip that it takes to get to and from these locations. Uh, you mentioned kind of the four walls, you know, in between the four walls or um, that that's where people are thinking about sustainability. Can you talk a little bit more about that, you know, four walls paradigm and what that means? Yeah, sure. We, we like to refer to that, that what you just referred to there is like the four walls paradigm. 
what that what that is is it's you know it's it's coming back to what I just said a minute ago that sustainability is becoming a core way that people think about decisions in real estate in the built environment, but it's limited by this paradigm that people are, I think, trapped inside right now, where we think of sustainability in real estate as being about fundamentally and totally about the materials we use to 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 build the structure, and how operationally efficient that structure is. We ignore things like uh, whether you need to drive back and forth to that location, whether it's easy for people who live at or work at that location to access other things nearby. The things that drive the crazy amount of emissions that come from personal transportation today, we know that about 30% of uh, emissions in the United States today come from uh, transportation. It's the largest single economic category driving emissions right now. And the bulk of those come from personal vehicle transportation. And we know that a, a huge number of trips are for short, short, you know, relatively short, like under three miles. Uh, more than half of uh, trips are for under three miles right now. We also know that looking at transportation survey data that um, the overwhelming bulk of trips right now are for people accessing things like grocery stores and schools and so on. And that's in cars, right? So um, if we're not thinking about where the pieces are on the game board, and we're only thinking about things like, um, you know, whether we can improve the efficiency of the engines that people move around in, or something like that. We're never really going to put a serious dent in the amount of miles uh, and the amount of emissions that are coming from transportation, at least not for another 30, 40 years. So, the four walls paradigm, in a sense, is a critique of the current way of thinking about sustainability in real estate to get us to think not just in terms of the envelope, but instead about the full ramification of where you're building what you're building and what that means in terms of the overall footprint of a household, not just the footprint of when they're changing the gauge on their heating measure and whether the concrete is clean, those things are important. But if people are spending an enormous amount of time in their cars as a result of where you live, that that's a decision that you have a lot of influence over, right? And so we're trying to expose mm -hmm. that four walls paradigm as a way of, uh, I guess, trying to, trying to force that onto people's agenda. Interesting, okay. Yeah, I mean that makes sense. I like how you, I like how that's phrased. Um, so let's get into the, you know the key topic today. So what is location sustainability? Presumably, this is getting beyond the four walls and talking about the next, mm -hmm. you know, that next stage in the sustainability, you know, matrix. I suppose. Yeah, sure. So location sustainability, I think, is a little bit like the yin to the yang of the four walls paradigm. It's it's the pieces that are missing, or a lot of the pieces that are missing. We think of location sustainability as the extent to which any given place is in a location or neighborhood where many of the core needs, daily, weekly needs of a household are possible or, or you can meet those things through some short walk or active mode of transportation uh, and where you have good access to transit to make you know accessing other parts of a city or region uh, fairly easy because not everything is going to be available nearby, even in the best location. It's not a binary concept. It's not like we uh, grade location uh, places based on you know whether they are or are not location sustainable. By you know by contrast, it's a, it's a it's a graded scale. So any given location will score somewhere on this notion of you know whether whether they are, it is or is not possible or easy to for a person who is located in a given place to access many of those core needs um, in uh, in the run of a day or a week. So accessibility is a core part of how we approach location sustainability, but it's not the only one. Pleasantness is a, is a really key one as well. Uh, so what do we mean by pleasantness? That's like the amount of greenery that's available, the infrastructure, the quality of the infrastructure that's available for people to move around on. Why is that important? Because we know that the likelihood of someone using, you know, going for a walk to a store or using their bike to get to a, a shop or work depends a lot on the quality of the experience and the safety of the experience of people using those modes of transit. Take the simple contrast between uh, someone walking, let's say, half a mile to get somewhere. If they do it along a tree-lined, fairly quiet street, that's one thing. If they need to cross a six- or eight-lane highway to get there, it's a very, very different thing. We know that the likelihood of someone walking is much higher in the former than in the latter. And so we take that into account when we're thinking about whether things are truly accessible in a way that makes likely active modes of transit uh, when we're, we're measuring places based on their location sustainability. And so, I mean, you started getting into this, but let's let's keep diving in. How does local logic play in this space? What what is it that you all do, um, and how do you you know think about 
location sustainability? Yeah, sure. Location. Uh, so Local Logic is a company that's digitizing the built environment. So we collect reams of data about uh, the, the built environment in cities and regions, and we expose that data to people making real estate decisions. We build a lot of insights on top of that raw data or, you know, slightly transformed data so that we're able to, you know, quantify things like, uh, like pleasantness and quietness and walkability and accessibility to different services and, and moving towards basically an index for location sustainability where we'll, we'll be able to actually, uh, you know, bring together the various things I was just talking about, like accessibility to core amenities and services and infrastructure coupled with pleasantness so that it rolls up into something like a location uh, sustainability and, or, and livability score and wellness score and so on. So we're, we're basically, we're collecting a lot of data about the built environment that people don't have easy access to. We're turning it into intelligence. So it's not just information, but intelligence that lies on top of that, uh, that those that reams of data and making it accessible through frameworks like location sustainability and wellness and, uh, and livability to People throughout the the the, the, the real estate you know uh, value chain, so uh, you know home buyers, tenants, uh, real estate developers, brokers, and eventually for investors as well. Who you know, and each of these audiences cares differently about these for different reasons about these things. For uh, for uh, an investor that that cares a lot about ESG reporting, maybe they they need to understand the, the you know the GHG uh, greenhouse gas emissions implications of owning or not owning a specific asset. And so you can take that same framework, which basically boils down to mobility, right? And mobility is a, has a clear um, a clear relationship with emissions and pollution and congestion and so on, and converting that into you know emissions terms that make sense for an investor, for a home buyer, uh, or for a developer. It might mean exposing opportunities for people to live in vibrant, uh, lower cost neighborhoods that were were you know transportation costs and, and time spent in traffic are much lower as a result of being proximate or semi-proximate to a bunch of amenities. So we use that intelligence, that core framework and expose it to different audiences to help them accomplish uh, different goals. Um, all of it fundamentally rests on the same, the same you know, uh, kernel of intelligence, which is understanding the relationship between the built environment and, and mobility and the ramifications for cost and livability and, uh, and carbon emissions. I mean, Anytime anyone talks about data and scoring and insights, I mean, you, you got you got my attention. I think uh, you know I've taken a look at some of the local logics tech. It's really interesting, um, pretty pretty intriguing. And you mentioned, I mean, you already got in. I was going to ask you a little bit more about like the different use cases. Who can use this? Home buyers, real estate developers, investors, tenants. Um, can you 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 kind of mentioned some of them, but can you go into maybe a little more in depth on uh, you know, maybe from the home buyer versus the kind of real estate developer look at sure. things. They're kind of two different yeah. stakeholders. Sure. So Local Logic is about six years old as a company, and many of the products that it built early on and continue that continue to be a, a kind of beating heart of the company are on the home buyer side and and in you know indirectly home buyer uh, because the the customer and user is uh, you know large brokerages. So think about you know, the Remaxes and Centruses and Realtors and, and so on of the world, um, those sites host a lot of information about real estate that is being bought and sold. Um, and home buyers and home sellers use those sites as, you know, those platforms as a way to, to facilitate those transactions. Um, the information classically on those websites has been about Unsurprisingly, the four wells paradigm, right? It's like how many bedrooms, how many square feet, uh, what's the price, like what's the age of the dwelling, and things like that. And of course, it's not new uh, that people who care, who want to move to a location, care deeply about what kind of neighborhood it is. Like, am I going to be able to send my kids to school, or am I going to have to drive everywhere? Am I going to be able to go to restaurants? Is it a vibrant neighborhood or not? Is it uh, is it too too wild and too loud for my liking? Am I close to transit? Those things have always been concerns. It's just that they were neglected. Uh, and so local logic built products that brought all of those, that, that intelligence to bear on those individual properties. And in some cases also integrated directly into the search function of those brokerages. So people buying homes, uh, it, it was much easier for them to get information about the kind of neighborhoods that they could be moving to. So that remains a core part of what local logic does. Um, 
we're adding on top of that, you know, like a, I guess a location sustainability prism where we're trying to help people understand not just the individual bits, like how walkable and how quiet and how you know green and uh, and so on uh, a neighborhood is, but to actually fold them together into a bit more of a, a conceptual framework so that we can make higher level claims about like the wellness, the overall wellness and overall livability and overall uh, you know sustainability of a given place, uh, rather than leaving it to people to assemble the individual pieces of intelligence together into something like uh, you know a wellness understanding. So. We're, we're building on top of the insights that we historically had. So that's the home buyer side. The investor is a bit different, right? The investors, uh, I mean, there are different kinds of investors. It's like the very high level, you have investors that hold thousands and thousands and thousands of properties. They don't necessarily know, they, like they, they, it's not possible for them to know those individual properties inside and out. Um, they right now do, they do monitor those properties um, financially. They're increasingly starting to monitor monitor some aspects of the environmental footprint of those of those properties. Uh, if you're familiar with things like a GRESB score, you know there, there are more and more uh, property managers and asset managers that are using this um, to measure the environmental footprint of properties. But that that framework is still very much in the four walls paradigm. Uh, and so what what we think we can bring to that conversation, and this is a bit more of an R&D um, piece than compared to some of our existing products, but what we think we can bring is using the location sustainability paradigm to help them understand the, the, the transportation related or mobility related emissions footprint of their different properties. Because that's a core, it's a core impact of real estate as we talked about earlier around land use and transportation patterns. Uh, the the impact of a property is not just in the type of energy that's used or the amount of energy that's used or the concrete that's used. It's also about how, how, what, what transportations you make likely. And so we want to, we're, we're working on developing a pair, you know, a set of tools that allow investors and asset managers and really large scale developers that are tracking the emissions of their portfolio to help them understand the mobility related emissions uh, and to make decisions over time that allow them to improve the sustainability of the individual locations um, and to move away from assets that fundamentally are unsustainable if they if they can't improve them. Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's really interesting. I mean, I, the, the home buyer piece makes a lot of sense and, um, you know, uh, logical, uh, local logical. Um, <laughs> but but I, I like this uh, kind of the R&D you're looking into from the you know, ESG side uh, for real estate investors as well. So is this something that only is valuable in, you know, city centers where a lot of things exist around a location or where are you really seeing like, you know, maybe this technology or just the general idea of, you know, location and sustainability, uh, being valuable? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So the short answer is no, absolutely not. Uh, the framework of location sustainability is applicable no matter where um, land is being put to some human use. Um, it could be in urban areas and suburban areas and rural areas. Um, and that's because the, you know, the, the implications of accessibility, proximity to different things matter no matter where you are, because a, column, you know, a mile traveled uh, in a vehicle is the same, you know, has, has the same kind of environmental impact virtually regardless of where you are, right? And, we, and and that's in terms of emissions, it's in terms of time spent in the vehicle, it's in terms of the amount of money that you're spending on gas. So those things don't change fundamentally when you move from rural to urban. Now, of course, a suburban location, let's just pick uh, an extreme, like single family detached residential only community, right? The classic sort of suburb image that you see when you, mm -hmm. if you Google suburb White compared, yeah. yeah, yeah. With nothing else around except, you know, large homes with big driveways and so on compared to, uh, let's say a denser mixed use neighborhood, uh, doesn't have to be fully downtown, but somewhere in a city where you have access to transit and some bike infrastructure, you know, not, not nothing perfect, but something that mm, is closer to the mixed use dense hub that you, that I described earlier, clearly the latter is gonna score much better on the location sustainability uh, index than will the former. But as I said earlier, it's not a binary thing. It's, it's a graded scale and there's a way of moving up that scale. And there are many options available to either of these, you know, the, the developers or the investors, um, and even in some cases to the tenants to improve their score without moving. Right? It's not just that the only option available to the suburban people is to move 
to abandon this property you know, investment and move to somewhere downtown, there are a lot of options available to improve the, the location sustainability of any either of these. Um, so for example, in the suburban setting, we know that uh, if there's a supermarket located in the neighborhood or a school that's more proximate, or if we build um, uh, you know, cycling infrastructure that connects to infrastructure in other neighborhoods, the likelihood of people reducing the amount of uh, miles that they spend in a car and using other modes of transit will, will improve, right? So there's ways that you can change the nature without actually moving or just abandoning uh, certain kinds of developments to, uh, to allow them to improve on the location sustainability index. Now, obviously, if you were to add a transit station to uh, a neighborhood like that, it would it would have a major impact. That's not something a typical developer is going to have much control over. But the location sustainability framework is is in a sense actor agnostic, right? So it's cities can also use this to understand to map the the gaps and opportunities across a city from a location sustainability perspective to better identify where transit um, uh, deserts might exist or food deserts or you know school deserts and, and so on and so forth. So we're hoping that that framework is usable across all, you know, from the individual ho household looking to move to the, to the, you know, the tenants, to the property managers, to the developers, to the investors and to the city governments and potentially, potentially other actors as well. Now that the same framework can expose opportunities and gaps and help generally improve the location sustainability of, of all locations and identify potentially where there's some places that simply should not be invested in because the, the, you know, the bang for the buck on the sustainability front will be to improve other parts of the city. And we potentially need to have hard conversations about whether certain assets are fundamentally just not going to be able, not worth it for us to turn into sustainable locations and we should just abandon them and move to other locations. I think all, all those discussions are possible. The framework is a graded framework that allows people to drill down and identify the different opportunities, the gaps that they might be able to fill. And, you know, like often comes to, you know, the conclusion we often come to in, in many of our episodes is, you know, start with the data, understand what's going on. I love this as an idea, using location sustainability as a framework to understand where to put investment, um, you know, where, you know, transportation demand management, CDM professionals should be thinking about their programs, what they should, where should they, they should be, where they should be putting them and what they should be putting um, in those locations. So this is our final question. Um, and it's my favorite one. And we ask everyone the same question. So why will this idea, this topic, you know, why will location sustainability help save the planet? Yeah. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, about 30% of emissions right now in the U.S. come from transportation. Uh, the bulk of those come from personal vehicle transportation, and about 80% of those of the miles traveled in cars are for just the daily, weekly needs that we need to fulfill. People are moving back and forth and relying overwhelmingly on cars right now. Uh, electrification of cars, we didn't talk about it, a big topic, but it's not going to be a short-term solution, right? Fleet replacement rates, dynamics mean that it's going to be decades before we really get to the point where electric vehicles dominate. And we know that electric vehicles are not emissions-free uh, right now at all. Building them and relying on, you know, dirty grids and so on mean it mean that that's, that's really not even a clean option today. So combustion engines are going to be remain dominant on the roads. Reducing the amount of uh, miles traveled in cars it has to be a, an enormous part of the solution. Location sustainability is about exposing uh, to all the different decision makers in real estate, investors, developers, home buyers, tenants, employers, retailers, the mobility implications of locating in one place versus another and what you put into an asset when you're there so that we can reduce the number of miles that people uh, you, uh, are, are, are in their cars for and, and are increasingly walking and biking as instead. That's great. I mean, couldn't have put it better myself. Uh, and I, I rarely could by the end of these episodes, I'm always, you know, this is great. I learn something new every, every time I record these and hopefully our listeners are as well. Uh, Jason, stick around for, you know, just a little bit. We have one final question for you, but um, for our listeners and viewers, I have three things to ask. One, wherever you're listening or wherever you're watching this, uh, give us a like, a follow, subscribe, a rating, whatever's relevant to your particular platform. That really does help. Uh, two, visit betweenthelines.io and subscribe to our email list. There you can you know, learn more. Through that email list, you can learn more about 
um, each of our speakers and kind of dive more deeply into those topics. And three, share this with some of your colleagues and friends. Um, if you think an episode's relevant to them, um, you know, ask them to check it out. There's some great episodes that we've had throughout this year. Uh, I think we're on episode 31 or 32. Uh, it's been it's been pretty great. Jason, our final question. Uh, we have this music playlist that we're building on Spotify for people's commutes, uh, you know, whether or not they have them. Um, and we're populating it with our guests' favorite songs. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's a song by the Bar Brothers. Uh, Even the darkness has arms. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure exactly why I love that, but it's something I listen to on my long, my long runs and bike rides. So it's just a, has a special place for me. Nice. You don't really have to have a reason for why you like a song. You know, it's just like it catches, yeah. uh, catches your attention. Well, Jason, thanks again for being on. This is. A really interesting episode, like I expected. Uh, anyone who's listening, I'm sure you can reach out to Jason with further questions about location sustainability, about local logic. Um, yeah, thanks for being on. Yeah, thanks very much, Andy. Super, super fun. And we'll see everyone again next week. Thanks for joining us on this week's episode of Between the Lines with Andy Keaton. Be sure to subscribe to hear next week's episode and check out our exclusive commuter playlists on Spotify.